that index inside the celery that's holding the strings that are associated with each state. Um, so all you had to do for that is display those states. If you used curly brackets, it would only display one of them. Um, it's just uh, this weird thing with celerays. But if you use parentheses, it'll show both. There's also a display statement associated with that as well. The last thing you had to do was out of the ones that satisfied condition one, you were supposed to find which one was the um, was the um, minimum. So you just took that initial um, array that you multiplied by and set it equal to the min of x only at the ends that you found, and then just displayed those states. So um, I'll post this on the um, on with the other review slides so that you can look at this again if you want to um, think about it a little bit more. Some review of topic three. Um, the biggest things are just being familiar with those operators and then also being familiar with logical indexing. Those were the two clickers that we just did. Um, and also just being familiar with the way logical indexing works versus like we use the find command and it's giving you elements back. Um, we haven't done much with if statements. We're going to do a lot more in this topic. Um, and then also I thought a big part of this topic was distinguishing between a single, single equal sign and a double equal sign. Um, the single equal sign is a definition. The doubles is a, a relational operator. Okay, a couple things that I noticed um, with this one is the matrix dimensions must agree was a common error that a lot of you got. So keep in mind that there's two reasons you could be getting this error. The first error that I have posted up here is because there is no dot. So because there's no dot, you're trying to multiply two, three element arrays by each other, and um, that does, that's not allowed by matrix multiplication. However, you'll see a similar error, error if you're trying to element by element multiply two arrays that have two different sizes. So I just wanted to show you the difference between these two errors that you're probably seeing and that you will probably continue to see. My last tip for you is, I think a lot of you are doing this, but to get into the habit of typing clear all at the top of your files, especially before you submit them. So um, especially when you're working on the quiz, a good idea would just type clear all and maybe even CLC um, so that you know exactly how the person running your file is going to see it. Because um, our M file that's, that runs the grading, that runs for grading, is clearing out the variables each time. Okay. Do you have a program that does it? We have a, I mean, I, um, we have a program that runs them, and then the rubric pops up in the, the tiers, and the rubric grades. So, in the tiers, are doing a lot of it, but it's a little bit automated. So, about the half? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> half? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn, this light being off is bothering me, but, Today we're going to be starting loops, and it is the best topic, most exciting topic, greatest topic, greatest everything. So what I decided to do is I have an activity that I'm gonna, we're going to do um, that I've already gotten volunteers to help me with, but I also have enlisted some support from an expert in the field to give you your first introduction to loops. So. Um, I had to interview this person. I need to plug in the sound. Um, because he couldn't make it because he was busy today. But uh, I think that's OK. I think this is better. Okay, so this is my son Burke, and he just demonstrated for you the two kinds of loops that you're going to be learning. So the first type of loop that he did is called a for loop, 
And the second type is called a wow loop. <laughs> and he did it. He did it. He's two. So you can do it too. <laughs> so proud of himself that he got an applause. Um, technically, this isn't exactly what the loops do, but um, not technically, it is exactly what they do. So what I'm going to do actually from now on with my notes is I'm going to do them in the MATLAB um, M file because then I don't have to switch back and forth. So a for loop is the first kind that Burke demoed for you. And um, <clears throat> So let me just actually give like a quick summary of, of the different types of things we're going to cover. So we're going to do for loop, um, while loop, and an if statement um, at the end. I just want to show you some nested into some loops. Okay, so the for loop um, is what we're going to start with. And the point of a for loop is it runs a set of commands, a predetermined number of times. So Burke showed you that. I asked him to run around the, the hoop three times and he ran around the hoop three times. Now he actually can only understand the concept of three right now so that was what I was limited to but the computer is able to do it any number of times. He can count to like 50 but he doesn't understand what any number above three is. He was even a little bit unsure there as you noticed. So um, all it does, people get overly complicated with for loops, but all a for loop does is um, the structure of the for loop is you create a for and an end wrapper, and um, any, anything inside the loop is the set of commands, so anything between the for and the end will be run however many predetermined number of times you say that it should run. So the way that you, the syntax for telling the loop to run is actually written as an array. So typical loop syntax <laughs> is to use the i um, variable to indicate the index of the array, or the index of the loop, <laughs> or the um, variable for the array. And I think this is probably the most confusing part of a loop, is that you have this array next to the for loop to indicate how many times. So all the loop will do is it will um, it will execute the loop for every element of the array that's up um, next to the four. So right now this array goes from one to ten, so the the array is ten big. So the loop's going to run ten times. The loop's going to run for i equals one, i equals two, i equals three, etc. So for now, let me just show you. Um, a, let me put some command in here. So I'm going to put a display statement because that's what we're really good at right now is display statements. And, um, and all I'm going to do is run it. And you can see that all it's going to do is execute that command 10 times. So that's the, most, the simplest way to see it. I can also um, print for you the, um, the index i. So i is going to start out as 1 and it's going to end as 10. So now it's going to print both the index and the display, the, display, um, uh, the display command that I executed. So here you can see that it's just doing 1, 2, and then a high in, in between every other one, or every one. <laughs> and one nice thing to start doing when you're writing loops, it, uh, this is really helpful for debugging, is to use what's called the this pause um, command, and all it does is it runs your um, your M file, but uh, will pause every time that line comes up. So I equals one, and then um, I gets displayed, the display gets d displayed, and then the pause happens. And then if you press any key in the command window, it's going to continue on to the next pause. So since the pause is in a loop, it's going to continue to pause um, every time it gets to line 13. So um, you have to actually, you can, and also if you're ever doing this, you can just hold down a key and it will just um, go through quicker. Did you say press any key? Yeah, I think you can press any key. Where is the end? 
Um, it's any of the keys. <laughs> I just tested it. Any key works. <laughs> okay. So now um, we're going to look at some other other ways to uh, use loops. Now keep in mind that it takes a while to get used to all this control flow. So we're going to just see a couple different ways that you can lo use loops, but you're basically going to be using them in every assignment that we do from now on. Um, so I'm going to show you some uses um, for things that you've already done. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the loop to define a, an array. <laughs> So we're just going to define an array of even numbers. And uh, just like with Burke, I am going to keep it limited to just the max of three um, for our loop because I want to be able to demo this um, on the stage with this um, activity. So method one that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to both show you it on, I'm going to program it, and then I'm, we're also going to do this little thing up on the, um, on the stage here. So the first method is um, using a loop to define an array without pre-allocating the array before. <clears throat> so all we're going to do is we're going to set up our loop, so our for and our end. And I pretty much exclusively use I notation for my loops, and then I have a system uh, because this is just how the modeling community does it. You use I for your first loop, and then every loop after goes J, K, M, N. So that's the notation that I use because that's the notation of my community. But you can choose any variable here. You could put bunny rabbit as your variable for your um, index. But um, I, J, K, M, and N are just the way that I think of a loop index. So that's what I use. So I'm going to go 1 to 3. Um, so we're just going to create an array that's the size 3. And so um, the array is going to look like this. It's going to be v equals 2, 4, 6. That's our final array that we're going to define. And I'm just going to show you three ways to define it. This is a very simple array to define, but the three methods are, uh, they extend much further than this example. So the way that you do it in a loop is you're going to define each element at a time. So inside the loop, you're going to um, use the variable v, <coughs> and then in parentheses, you're going to call out the index um, of, the, uh, of the array. So we're going to first start by defining the two, the first um, array element. So uh, if I use the index i, if I take two times the index i, then each time I go to the next index, I'm going to define the next element of the array. So two times one is two, two times two is four, two times two is three. So as the loop goes through each index, it will define two, four, and six, right? So what I'm going to do is show you what this looks like with um, a group coming up here. And we're going to do it two ways. So the first way is method one, and that is um, a loop without preallocation. And then the second way is the loop uh, with preallocation. So with preallocation, you're going to, before you define um, the, ver the values in the loop, you're going to pre-allocate v with zeros. So I'm going to create the right size of the array. And then I'm going to, in my loop, have the exact same thing. But visually, um, when we do it up here on the stage, you're going to see how different that is for the computer and why you have to pre-allocate, but you also see a little bit about how the loop is actually functioning, um, computing. And actually, I'm going to have the, um, the volunteers, 
I'm going to have them also show, show it this way as well. So the third um, way is vector notation. So we'll show what that looks like and what that, how that is different for each of these. So if I could get my volunteers to come up. That's the that's um game plan too. Can you guys just get in line over in that corner? Okay, so I'm gonna be the for statement, and um, so my for loop is i equals one to three. So let's start with the first one, which is um, without pre-allocation, you know, because it's not so. so the first one, what's going to happen is the loop's going to start with i equals 1. So that's the first time the loop runs. Um, I'm going to have the first, this is, each of these, um, these people are representing like a space in the computer that's going to hold this data, okay? So when I run this loop, I'm going to bring in my first piece of data, so come in, and I'm going to have you define what v of 1 is. No, it's, two. it's 2, so write 2 on your board. And then step back into storage. Okay, so that's what it does when it's not pre-allocated. So now we have an array, it's size 1, it only has one element, and it's just 10. Okay, now i equals 2. So I'm going to get my next two people to come in. You're defined as 4, and you're defined as 2. So you just get carry out, you're just carrying over what's already here, but it's getting defined a second time in memory. So basically it's creating a whole new vector v. Can you guys reverse yourselves? Which is 2 and 4. Okay? So now we took three spaces, and we're only on the second iteration of the loop. Okay? Now I'm going to go to i equals 3. I'm going to get three spots now because I need to put this in the third spot of the array. And now these three are 2, 4, and 6. Okay? So now it took all six of them to do this one loop. And all we needed was an array that's three big. So these three, these first three guys, they got, they're forgotten about. We don't even use them anymore, but they took up space in our memory, okay? But now these guys are the only ones that are used. We just wasted all of those guys. So go back into your line. That's method one. That's defining the array without pre-allocation, okay? Now, my first three, can you please pre-allocate yourselves with a zero? So now we're on line 22, and these three guys are now pre-allocating the V array. So show your zeros. And now I'm going to operate the loop again with pre-allocation. Let's see how different it is. So now I'm going to access the first element of my V array that's already pre-allocated. So you are 2 now. Change your number to 2. Overwriting you. You were originally 0. It's a lot of pressure upside down. Okay. Now, now I'm going to go to the second, the second one. Change your number to four. Look at that. How useful do they feel? <laughs> they got to use their boards. They didn't get forgotten about. And then I'm going to do the third one. Six. We didn't even need those guys. We didn't even use them because we pre-allocated. We said, we know what we're doing. We are going to put this stuff here, and then we put that stuff there. Now, let's do method three. You three guys who were just pre-allocated, do you know how you would do method three? Anyone have any suggestions? Do you need me? Nope. All of you, at the same time, put your number down. 
<laughs> so that was slightly different cases, but if they were computers, they would write in the right direction, and they would be all at the same time. So which is the best method? Three is best method, right? Um, next best, best is method two, and worst method is method one, and if you're doing stuff with like loops that are thousands and millions big, that could be differences in days in your calculation, okay? You guys can... So wait, wait, do, are we all twos here? Nope, still same vector, it's just that you're all getting defined at the same time. It's still seven. It's still seven. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so it starts at two, skips every two, and ends at six. Two, four, six. Oh, so we are the last three. Nope. This takes three bits. It takes three 64 bit spaces. Yes. But. <laughs> no. These are people. Okay. So that's why pre allocating is important. So anytime you can, vector notation is the fastest and best method. But as you can imagine, you can't always vectorize everything. It's not possible to do all your calculations that way. So we're going to spend the next, couple, um, the next couple of topics making sure that we know how to do loops because they're oftentimes required to do the things that we need to do, okay? And if you're going to do a loop and you're going to define something in a loop, you must pre-allocate it in order to avoid a lot of wasted memory space. Problems that we're doing, wasting three spaces in memory, not a big deal. But that's not why you do it. It's because usually you're dealing with huge data sets that take up a lot more space than that. Okay, now um, I want to show you how to use a loop. So that was to use a loop to uh, define something. So now let's look at using a for loop to do a calculation. So this is another thing that you guys have been doing a lot. You just did it in your last quiz. There's going to be just a lot of typos when I'm typing, so let's just all embrace them, okay? Because there's just no time for that. So what we're going to do is um, take two arrays. So I'm just going to define two arrays using vector notation. So I'm going to make some pretty big arrays and um, <clears throat> show you what that will look like. So I'm going to um, define an array P and an array Q. So again, I'm just going to use the colon notation to create two arrays that are 100 big. One of them is filled with numbers 1 through 100. The other one's filled with even numbers until 200. And um, if I wanted to multiply those two using vector notation, I would just use the dot and do element by element multiplication. So that's what you guys have been doing in your array section. However, you can do the same thing but in a loop. So in a loop, you're going to create your wrapper for your loop and with your for and your end. And this is where you have to start getting into the mindset of indexing because now you're inside a loop and remember a loop only works for one index at a time. So if I want to define an array i, I need to index that i. So when i equals 1, which is where the loop is going to start, you're going to fill the first element of m. And if we're just doing regular element by element multiplication, all you're going to do is grab out the first element of P and multiply it by the first <laughs> element of Q. Now you could think about this on your own by just doing them individually, which a lot of you actually did when you did your calculations on the quiz. You pulled out individual elements, you found means and whatnot. A loop does that, but instead of doing it, so M, we know that M of 1 equals P of 1 times Q of 1, and then M of 2 equals p of 2 times q of 2 and then m of 3 equals that this could take a long time do you think so too especially if it's big all the loop is doing is saying okay I recognize that I'm doing the same thing a hundred times so instead of doing it a hundred times I'm just gonna put it in a loop and have the loop do it a hundred times okay so it just generalizes instead of doing one 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 two 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 
it's just putting all I's in for each of those counters. So, um, so that's what the loop looks like. And um, what am I missing when I did this calculation? You don't need the dot because you're always calling out single numbers, right? P of I is always going to be one number. Method one, two, and three that we just talked about, I said one of those is bad, and I'm doing that method. Yeah, I didn't pre-allocate M, right? M is just growing, and so there's going to be 100 factorial Ms. No, what is the other one? 1 plus 2 plus 3, 2 plus 100 Ms. So um, we know that it needs to be 1 to 100, so you're just going to need to pre-allocate it before. The last thing I wanted to show you with this um, is that instead of explicitly putting 100 in here, um, the best thing to do for this is to use the length function where um, you automatically have it um, sized and the um, loop sized based off of the length of the arrays that you're dealing with. So your loops can almost always be defined as one to the length of something. Can you guys see this? It seems small. I know I ask you this all the time, but it seems really small. I mean, I'm just going to make it bigger and not even listen to you. Mm. Isn't it too small? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, you can actually put any array in the for loop, any array at all. So it can be uneven, it can be not in increasing order, it can be totally random numbers. It's always going to run for every element of the array. This, this particular loop is replacing the previous one that putting a Yeah, this entire code right here. Yeah, so this is method one, this is method two. Okay. So this is multiplication with, um, this is array multiplication, and this is element, sorry, element by element <laughs> multiplication. And this is multiplication with loops. They do the same thing. Yeah, you want to check? Should we check it? So what could we do to check to see if these two m's are the same? Let me define them as two different things. What kind of relational thing could I do? m equals equals 1. m equals well, I haven't run this for a while, so let's see if there's a million errors. I think I just spelled it wrong. Okay, that's great. Maybe I should, um, uh, let's do, let's, so we want to see that they're all M's. So if we sum all of them, then they should be 100, right? That they're all the same. So they're the same. Could have also just changed it to like three big, you know, 100 big. But yeah, it does the same thing. Um, you're going to do some of those in your um, pre-lab too to compare different things like that. Okay, so that's a, enough about for loops. Let me just show you a while loop. So remember that the while loop um, that Burke showed you is different in that a while loop is um, it runs a, a set of commands until a condition is satisfied. So Burke's condition was when his mother told him to stop which is not a really good analogy, but um, basically there's something inside the loop that's changing and it's going to continue to run until um, a condition is met by something inside the loop. So let me give you an example of um, something that we already did with the if statement. So let's say that you're going to request a 
This is also, by the way, one of the hardest ones to teach you at this point because most applications of while loops um, require um, like some uh, higher engineering analysis of like errors. It's often used like you'll run and you'll run some calculation until the error is small enough. If that makes sense. So a lot of times the condition in the while loop is that the error is small, um, and we can't do a lot with that quite yet. So what I'm going to show you instead is an example of getting a user input since we've done that before. So I think I showed you this with the if statement where I just write um, a user prompt where I'm asking the user to tell me what 2 plus 3 is. And, um, and I basically want to keep asking the user what 2 plus 3 is until the user um, tells me the right answer. So uh, what you have to basically do is write a condition up here and the condition, the trick is a while loop condition is a condition that, um, that, that the while loop runs as long as that condition is true. So often it's the opposite of what you want to think about. So we want the, um, we want the user to put that x equals 5, right? But if the user puts x equals 5, we actually want to stop asking them. So the condition is actually you want to keep running the loop um, as long as x does not equal 5. Once x equals 5, you want to stop the loop because they got it right. So you always want to kind of put the opposite condition that you're trying to get usually. So um, let's run this one. And let's just see how it works. And I'm actually going to... Yeah, I'm just going to do that. So it's prompting. I'm going to put 6, 2, 8, 6, 5. And then it stops. And you can have some other conditions in there that congratulate or make the person feel horrible that they didn't get it right. Um, but that's the basic idea of a while loop. Um, <clears throat> some people prefer while loops over for loops, and while loop can always replace a for loop. So let me show you that next. Um, so while loop can always replace a for loop. So let's go back to the for loop that we wrote where we just defined those even numbers. So we can do the exact same thing but with while loop logic. So um, I'm going to create and pre-allocate um, an array that's three big. And then um, I'm going to create the wrapper for my while loop, so my while and my end. And inside my loop, I'm going to define my, um, my elements of my array just like I did before. So this all looks very familiar, right? Um, you have a question? That is an excellent question. So a while loop cannot start unless the condition is, is met, right? It's not going to go into the loop unless the condition is met. So you have to always give a value to whatever the condition is before it, get, before it can go in there. So if x didn't have a value, and I can actually just show this um, by commenting that out. So if I didn't have a value, I would get an error on that line saying it doesn't know what x is. Um, so not only does it need a value, but it needs a value that satisfies the loop. So you, want, you, you would not want to start the value off at 5 because then it would never go into the loop. Another question? If the user inputted 0, what would the answer is that 5? Because 0 is still not 5. So the condition is that x doesn't equal 5. So you put 0 into x, it still doesn't equal 5, so it's going to keep going. You were thinking now 0 equals 0. Um, so can you define x as 1? Yep, you can, in this case, you could define it as anything other than 5 to get it started. Um, yeah. And you're going to have to do this in lab 4 when you do the, the root finder. You're going to have to... Um, <laughs> not put the root in as the guess or it's not going to run either. Any other questions about that? Okay, 
So here we're doing the same thing. We pre-allocated an array, and now we're going to go ahead and fill each element with two times the index. But the difference is that you don't have um, a predetermined um, array here in the while loop. Instead, you have to put a condition. Okay, so the way that you can do it that works out to be the same is you can initialize your i as one, and then you can say, I want my loop to run as long as i is less than or equal to three. And then what do you have to do inside the loop? Yep, uh, you have to advance i. And this is something we're going to do all the time. It's called a counter or a, a, it's an index tracker. Um, and because there's no intrinsic counter in a, in a while loop like there is in a for loop, like a for loop's always going to have an index associated with it, a while loop you're going to have to explicitly keep track of that counter. So we initialize a counter that I'm continuing to call i as 1. And then my condition is that I want to keep running this loop as long as i is less than or equal to 3. And then inside the loop I'm going to advance the counter um, one at a time. So this will give you the exact same array as <clears throat> when we did it with the for loop. So let's run it. Um, here with the um, uh, index suppressed. So here what you can see is I, un I unsuppressed this line that's doing the counter. And the last one is 4 because it advances to 4 but then 4 never gets used because then 4, no, like four makes it so that the condition is, is no longer satisfied so it stops. But if I print out w, um, w is the same as it was with the for loop. So I've actually worked with a lot of people and students who just prefer while loops in general because they just make more sense to them because that array in the for loop is just doesn't doesn't work in their brain, you know, like that array just doesn't have enough substance. And this makes more sense to them that you just have a counter that you initialize and then that you advance inside of the, the loop. So uh, basically a while loop completely um, replaces the need of a for loop. Um, in this in this case, Do you have a question. <laughs> you didn't like that I said that. So why are we doing a for loop? Yeah. So it always does it in this order. So it'll define the W. It will advance I. Then it goes through the loop one more time. Then I changes. Um, now I is changed. Now I is like two. And then it does it again in that order. OK, so we'll have to do the, the um, nested loops next time. Um, so we'll do that next time, um, as well as nested if statements. <laughs>